All right, so our next reader, um, Ed Greenwood, is probably one of the most prolific writers I know. Um, you know, the break went a little bit longer than we expected, and I believe he wrote two novels during the break. So anyway, um, officially, he is an award-winning Canadian writer, editor, game designer, columnist, and librarian, possibly sous chef too, I don't know. Best known as the creator of the Forgotten Realms fantasy world, his New York Times best-selling fantasy novels have sold millions of copies worldwide in over 30 languages. He has been a judge for the World Fantasy Awards and the Sunburst Awards, and been guest of honor at more than 60 conventions. Hailed as the Canadian author of the great American novel, an industry legend, a true genius, and one of the greats, Ed was inducted into the Academy of Adventure Gaming, Art and Design Hall of Fame in 2003. And more importantly, he is here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Ed Greenwood! Wow, who is that scary guy? No more stories that pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to read to you tonight from a little thing I'm playing with with David Hartwell called The Iron Assassin. We may or may not publish it, and it may or may not be called The Iron Assassin. <laughs> he is falling. It is over. All over. The game lost, and his life with it. The soft, tiny glows of a thousand distant gas lamps rise past his gaze as he falls, despair rising bitterly to choke him. Below, the dark ribbon of the Thames. Around it, London sprawling away in all directions into the fog-shrouded night. The greatest city in all the wide world, seat of the Empire of the Lion, the throne he's been proud to serve. Its once impenetrable ocean fogs writhing like churning waves, as they always did these last few years, under the billowing plumes of countless smokestacks. The fires that burst the steam that moved everything. Mills stamped and shuddered, Trains squealed, great cogs clattered, driving the empire on into a brighter, richer tomorrow. And with a cruel suddenness, he is leaving it all behind, plunging into death unregarded. It is all going to go on without him. Dread ancient of the tower and sworn sword of the lion he might be, but in the end, he is utterly unimportant after all. The Blood Slayer clutches at him again, snarling, the fangs usually hidden in the roof of its mouth, fully down now, long and cruel and gleaming. They snap in the air, all too close to his throat. He takes what little satisfaction he can in swinging his cane through them with all the force he can muster, feeling and hearing them shatter like so many icicles. Take that, you foulness. The force of his blow spins him into a tumble in the air that leaves him facing down, to watch his death, rushing up to meet him, the dark spires and roofs of Lambeth. At least the vampire is going to die with him, a last desperate hook of his cane sweeping it from the same parapet it had thrust him over. Or will it live, shattered and in agony because he lacks anything silver to sear it with? And there should have been no blood slayers in the household guard, none at all. Is this the only one, or are there more? Damn it to the heavens, how far does the taint reach? Into the imperial family itself? He fights as the plunge claws the air from his lungs to get out one last shout. For God, the Lord Lion, and England! Does he manage it all before the heavy crash that brings oblivion? The Blood Slayer is the only being that might know. And amid the sliding ruin of cracked and broken roof slates, he cannot say. Sprawled into wet red pulp, it is too busy trying to shriek and failing. There seems to be a lot of failure about in London these days. Chapter One, entertaining everything. Hardcastle paused, pipe on its way to his lips, but now knife forgotten in his hand as he stared at the thing that should not have been there, yet most evidently was. He took a step back glancing up and down the dark passage as if several lurking someones were about to catch him in some indiscretion, leaping out with loud jeers to denounce him as a lunatic, a freer of slaves or one of those wild wits who believes in magic. Yet this uppermost hallway at the back of the Lessingham Club was as dimly lit and deserted as he always remembered it being, 
on his rare glances along it as he hastened across it from the top of the great staircase to the door of the Hargriffin room. Hargriffin, that bright tapestry bower, where well, until the Lord's Temporal had changed the Liberty's laws, Lessingham's had housed its visiting strumpets for the entertainment of members willing to pay an extra angel or four vintage rose nobles a fortnight. Hardcastle found himself smiling amid fond and vivid memories. Oh, not now, by Jove. Firmly putting reverie aside and returning to the here and now, he cleared his throat as quietly as he knew how and regarded the passage once more. He idly strolled the length of it once, he recalled, and encountered a lost legion of closed and forbidding dark doors, cobweb silence, a total lack of servants, hovering or otherwise, and nothing waiting at the end of it all but a servant's gong on the wall at the head of the narrow, precipitous servant's stair. He could see that gong now, and a choice selection of the doors, too. Hmm, nothing had changed. He was alone in the dim silence, standing before the door that led, if the dusty brass nameplate could be trusted and its very undisturbed venerability bespoke trustworthiness, into the Havelstoke room, staring at what adorned the upper center of the door, a large brass shield out of which thrust a flattened but still boldly massive lion's head, eyes closed and jaws clenched around a ring that could have held fast a loaded Thames coal barge, staring in puzzlement now that his initial astonishment had ebbed. Surely this knocker hadn't been here before. Well, of a certainty, he'd never noticed it. Small wonder that, for who would think to look here for a door knocker? Here, on the uppermost floor of a long-established gentleman's club in Mayfair, five thickly carpeted flights up for the great ground floor rooms most members kept to, clustering daily to mutter or snarl over whiskies and cigars. It, it wasn't as if this dim, deserted passage was the street, nor was the room beyond the door a private residence. It was part of the club. A dark-paneled meeting room he'd been given to understand was very much like another meeting room on the floor beneath, one he'd spent more than one evening in over the years. So beyond that door were almost undoubtedly dark walls with darker, dirtier paintings hanging on them, forgettable old masters brought back from the continent and gifted to the club to pay off whiskey debts, a huge round table with chairs, a spittoon or two, and a sideboard with a great stag's head mounted over it. Oh, and there'd be a fireplace at one end of the room that would do very little to either heat or light the rest of it. So, why a knocker? Yet, there the thing was, as plain as the nose on his face, and thanks to birthright and many battles on old school playing fields, he had a large and battered beak that was very much in keeping with the old and undistinguished surname he'd inherited. Not just a knocker, either set into the brass shield in a curving row down its nearest descending curve were a roll of keyholes. Locks to what? Lock the door shut with multiple bolts? This, this mongery shouldn't be here. Confound it, it hadn't been here. So should he use it to announce his arrival? Or just throw wide the door and step in? He was a member after all, yet even after all these years, he was still discovering obscure old rules at Lessingham's, the breaking of which resulted in fines and disapproving looks from the staff and senior members, followed by silences when one entered a room. Dashed uncomfortable and annoying, that. Hardcastle shifted from foot to foot in indecision, then spun, hands clenching and quickening alarm at the soft scrape of a hurrying stride behind him, close behind him. Waiting for me, Blaze? How gallant, we can go in fashionably late and together. A familiar voice rasped, low and breathless. It was Straker, Jack Straker, as lean and hawk-like as ever, almost upon him and in as much of a hurry as usual. Straker, who clapped one hand on Hardcastle's shoulder as he flung wide the door of the Hargriffin room with the other. Good afternoon, gentlemen, he said briskly, practically charging into the room and dragging Hardcastle with him, his fingers suddenly iron-hard talons. Thankfully, he just as suddenly let go of the shoulder he was nigh crushing to bustle on into the room, dusting his hands as he advanced upon a tall, substantial wooden box that was leaning upright in one corner. Thankfully, because Hardcastle needed to pause and swallow and stare. Ah, capital! Straker informed the room, they set it the right way up! Splendid, splendid! To Hardcastle, Straker's 
great wooden box looked like a pauper's coffin. Not that he spared it more than a moment's attention. He was too busy staring at those seated around the table, some of whom were staring back at him. Others were beyond staring at anyone. The chairs, table, walls, and old masters were all very much as he'd expected. Facing him across that gleaming acre or so of dark, glossy, polished wood was no less august a personage than Lord Quentin Staunton, founder and sponsor of Lessingham's. Monocle, gently wry smile, lone wavy lock of white hair slicing through his raven comb back, lace at the wrists of the hands clasped on the jeweled sword stick, the old man himself. At the Lord's left elbow sat a hard glaring man with a nose even more battered than Hardcastle's own, that one barely noticed in the ragged ferocity of the huge mustache beneath it. The man's balding head looked as hard as a knight's helm, and his bowler, complete with bullet holes, sat squarely on the table before him. As Hardcastle recalled, the man had only three faces, dour and grim, carefully expressionless, and utter fury blazing forth. They'd met twice or thrice before, not in good circumstances, and Hardcastle had hoped to go to his grave, uh, three score years or more hence, without ever laying eyes upon him again. Chief Inspector Theo Standish of the Yard. On the other side of his lordship sat a fat, large-headed, bespectacled man whose clothes outshone Staunton's in splendor. A man the wider public might not recognize, even with that vast forehead and formidably bushy eyebrows, but all too familiar to anyone who aspired to wealth in the city. A man of Whitehall, whose rank was high and whose chief concern was taxes, gentlemen's taxes, ensuring the prompt and full payment of same. Hardcastle had heard his name spat from scores of lips in the rooms downstairs, at races, and in splendid country houses. Hallworthy Burton. Burton of Whitehall was not a popular man, and by the venomous, self-satisfied expression on his face, took sour delight in that. Yet, neither the founder nor the poisonous stares of the men seated with him were what so arrested Hardcastle's attention. It was the rest of the men seated at the table, silent and dust-covered, slumped in the dark frock coats of earlier days that transfixed his attention. They were so obviously dead, all of them, long dead, lolling in their chairs, mummified, dropped jaws yawning and sunken eyes long past seeing anything. One was quite skeletal and his neighbor had collapsed, grisly head having long ago departed decaying shoulders and rolled across the table to a stop on its side and thankfully facing away from Hardcastle, nigh the near edge of the vast beating table. Ah, quiet of founders, Lord Staunton explained dryly. They seldom vote these days. Hardcastle nodded abruptly, trying vainly to think of the right response. He was still struggling when Straker took the need to do so quite away from him. All lean arms and legs, panther-like pounce and alert energy. Hardcastle's friend had been unlocking and unlatching like a madman. He now stood back from the coffin-like box with an air of satisfaction, faced the table with a broad smile, and said briskly, I must apologize for our lateness, gentlemen. London's traffic, as I'm sure you've noticed, grows ever worse. Another argument for your elevated steam tramways, Straker? Burton's voice was flat and sour. Some of us have heard more than enough of them. The hawk-like young inventor greased his reply with an affable smile. Do you know, Burton, settled and successful men always prefer matters to be as they were when they rose to prosperity and rail against the new. Yet the new always comes. However they object and whatever laws they pass to try and prevent it, I'm told your father railed against the post, saying it would enable malcontents to more easily send messages to each other from the docks to outlying counties and the wells of Scotland and Wales beyond. Yet no one would now be without it. Your father and your uncle both opposed establishing colonies across the Atlantic, seeing no benefit at all in conquering vast and frozen wastes of uninhabited wilderness called Canada. <laughs> Yet the fur coat you take such pride in came from that largest of our dominions, and half the steam boilers across our great empire are now daily stoked with the trees and coal of that same frigid wasteland. You yourself were dead set against enough, Mr. Straker. 
Burton said coldly. You have a strange way of courting my approval, I must say. There's a lot you must say, Burton, Standish said heavily. Yet however young and, well, strange this man may be, he's promised us a weapon against the Blood Slayers. Let us hear him out. Unless you've something more brilliant to offer. Burton's head snapped around with the speed of the proverbial striking at him. Have a care, policeman. You forget your place by the Lord lie you do. I will die of apoplexy, Burton, someday, if you don't take things more calmly, Lord Staunton observed firmly, leaning forward to fully interpose himself between the mantle of Whitehall and the swift hand of the yard. The Chief Inspector is right. We are here to entertain Mr. Straker's proposal, so he spread a hand, Mr. Straker. The young inventor bowed. Thank you, Lord. You're, you're most kind. He spun around, hand outstretched. Behold the box. We could hardly help but not, officer. Staunton replied dryly. It contains your new weapon? It does. Some sort of blunderbuss? Standish leaned forward in his eagerness. Steam-powered? To hurl out a stream of bullets, as the rumors have been hinting? Silver bullets? I mean to say, the box is rather large. It would hardly serve London and its citizens well, Straker replied sharply, to go about the streets launching streams of bullets at any presumed blood slayer. This is not, after all, America. <laughs> he drew himself up and with a conjurer's flourish produced from behind his back one of the fastenings he'd removed from the box earlier. It was a simple block of wood, from around which he unwound a long wire to lay bare a folded metal handle. Unfolded, this became a crank, and two of the inventor's impatiently swift steps took the wire to hook about a particular broad-headed metal nail, among many such that studded all edges of the box. Straker returned to where he'd been standing and held out his contraption. Observe! It's a block of wood, Burton sneered. Now, what do I win? Patience, it is to be hoped, Straker told the ceiling briskly. If England is to go from strength to strength rather than declining in decadence, we need ever open minds at Whitehall. Bolshevik, yeah. Burton spat. Is that your latest leaning, Master Tax Clerk? If so, your mind is weaker than I'd thought. Bolshevist philosophy employs more than a little dodgy reasoning. You'd do better, Burton rose abruptly and caught up his walking stick. I did not come here to be insulted. Lord Staunton's sword cade lashed out, sending Burton's stick spinning across the room to crash against the heavy gilt frame of an undefending old master and glider to the floor. You came here, the Lord snapped in a voice of sudden iron, because the Lord Lion himself commanded you to, not only to attend here this day, but to listen and observe and use your best judgment in the secret conclave as to what Mr. Straker is offering England in one of its all too many hours of need. Storm out if you like, but be well aware that if you do so, you will also be walking away from your position. Mr. Burton, one word from me to the Lord Lion. You not dare. On the contrary, I was ordered to by our dread sovereign himself. The sword stick was deftly returned to its former position. You've made many enemies by your manner, Burton, the glee with which you persecute citizens seeking more coins here and yet more there. The complaints wear down even the noblest of kings, and our Lord Lion is many things, but a font of infinite patience is not one of them. Lord Staunton added a sigh, then reached up a silver flask from one boot top and held it out. Now, let us set all these hard words aside. Have a drink and sit back down and listen to young Straker. Madness his weapon may seem to you, but the Blood Slayers are hardly normal now, are they? And damn me if I can think of any effective weapon we might use to stop them right now. We must entertain everything. Lord White Constable's exact words to me, those, Standish said heavily, we must entertain everything. Small wonder. Lord Staunton told him. The Lord Lion spoke that sentence to me, too, and to Burton, I happen to know. One can hear quite clearly through the people in the portrait of good Queen Alice. Paul Worthy Burton had long since gone a sickly yellow-white, but now he turned quite gray and reached for the proffered flask, 
as he sat heavily back down, looked at the tabletop and said unwillingly, I, uh, sorry, I, uh, I tender my apologies to you all, wife. I've not been myself lately. Many of us are in that position, sir, Straker said softly, yet we must all remember that even so, we are the fortunate ones. Burton drank, gasped at the fiery potency of what had swallowed, then growled, how so? The blood slayers have not yet come hunting us, Straker explained gently, so we still have our lives. The sharp rap at the door was as sudden as it was unexpected. Lord Hawkingbrook frowned, turning to glare at the two stolid household guards flanking the door, as if the interruption was their fault. Who can that be? By their strict orders, we were to be undisturbed. Before either could reply, the door between them was flung wide. Their halberds came up in swift menace and were struck aside by a bared and ready sword whose wielder wore a war gauntlet of ancient style, a splendid tabard, and a glower to match Hockey Brooks O. It was old Throckmorton, the Imperial Herald. Away, steel! He snapped, all be obedient before royal Harminster, Lord Lion of the Empire, King of England and its dominions, low and high, sword of the seas and defender of the Two-Face, dread Lord of London. Throckmorton was a short man. Everyone in the room could see a familiar trim-bearded face behind him, whose piercing blue eyes outshone the three sapphires in the circlet on the Emperor's brows. They all went to their knees in hasty unison. Rise, all of you, the Lord Lion said rather wearily as he lowered himself into the vacant seat at the head of the long table. I've seen enough about heads this day. Hawkingbrook, I'm told Langford is dead. Is this true? It is, Majesty. Great, gray-bearded Lord Guardian said curtly. Spattered all over a rooftop in Lambeth. Fallen from the parapet of the South Signal Tower. Pushed. By someone he dragged with him. Yes. A blood sore by the looks of the gore and the lack of a body. It slithered away like a serpent of blood, I'll warrant, Lady Rose Hailsham said in dark satisfaction, not striding or even staggering. I'm sure knowing that will comfort Langford daughters deeply, the scarred man sitting beside her rasped. Lord Gaunt, Lady Rose said sharply, I will comfort John Langford daughters tonight and henceforth. Before both altars and all men, I'll be their sponsor, and their guardian too, if they'll have me. The Lord Lion sighed. It will be years, if ever, before they're ready to serve the Empire as their father did. No trail, I presume? Our best men are searching all Lambeth right now, Majesty, Gaunt said shortly. Thus far, we've found these. He pointed down the table at two small and gleaming things that sat on a cloth in front of a gloomy-looking Lord Winter. One under what was left of Langford, caught in his clothing, Hockeybrook added, the other in a roof guard, gutter, where it might end up if someone slid, slithered, dripped, Gaunt murmured, over the edge of a roof. The Lord Lion might have been in the waiting days of the 31st year of his reign, but there was nothing at all wrong with either his eyes or his wits. Buttons from a household guardsman's uniform. So if your best men are searching Lambeth, Who's taking a look at all of them? Richmond, the Lord Guardian replied, and he should be reporting back to us here any moment now. He, a commotion arose outside the door, the thunder of boots rapidly approaching at a run. One man, the door banged open again, but this time the guards were ready with their halberds. The man they nearly spitted, recoiled from them and almost fell, shouting, Majesty, all of you, Carrington and the Seneschal, both blood slayers, and got away from us clean. There, his wild gaze, fell upon the two guardsmen barring his way, and he sprang back, pointing frantically, these two I've not yet. The halberds swung away from him in a flash of sharp war steel that became a swift and wordless charge across the room, right at the Lord Lion's back. Where are your majesty? Hawkingbrook roared, hurling himself in front of one halberd and taking it full in the chest, as the Lord Lion sprang up out of his chair in a frantic dive forward, landing on his stomach on the table and sliding along it. The gleaming imperial boots kicked at the vacated chair to launch the Lord Lion on his way, knocking it back into the shins of the second charging guardsman, who stumbled, halberd swinging high. Under it, hurtled Lord Gaunt, slamming hard into the face of the charging traitor, fists up and punching. The two men crashed into the edge of the table together, halberd clanging as it tumbled away, and they punched, shoved, 
and struggled. A struggle that ended in a sudden spasmodic flailing as the Lady Rose's silver-bladed dagger sank hilt deep into the guardsman's ear. Two frantic seconds after she torn it out of the gore-spurting right eye socket of the other guardsman, who had taken just a moment or three too long trying to yank his halberd out of the groaning, dying Lord Hockingbrook, who gave last one last choking gurgle and expired. Sudden silence fell. Sir Richmond, the Lord's Gaunt and Winter, and the Lord Lion all used it to do the same thing, to stare at Lady Rose Hailsham as she wiped her dagger clean on the already smoldering uniform of one household guardsman then planted one button-booted foot on the seat of a handy chair, calmly hiked her skirts up to her waist to reveal the empty dagger she strapped to that leg beside her garters and slid her little silver fang back into its home again. Lady, the Lord Lion said a little breathlessly, the moment those skirts had safely returned to the vicinity of their wearer's ankles, you have done us great service. Steady gray eyes met his. Not yet, Majesty, their owner replied, but I fear I may soon have to. She sighed, like Hawkingbrook here. She looked from his sprawled dead body to the two just as lifeless blood slayers who were now burning fitfully. How many more serpents are in our midst, I wonder? We're going to have to do a lot more than wonder, Gaunt growled, nursing a halberd sliced forearm, and soon, or we'll all be dead, and this will be the blood slayer empire. Chapter 2, Mad Jack Straker's Weapon Pray observe, Straker announced, the box. He turned the crank on the block of wood he was holding, one slow revolution and then many faster ones, building into a whir. The metal hub of the crank clacked repeatedly with well-oiled, smoothly machined confidence. An occasional spark spat from various places along the wire, linking it to the upright box, from within which there came a muffled chime. Straker stopped cranking, set the block of wood down on the floor, and stepped back from it, waving both hands at the box in the behold flourish of the traveling conjurer. The box responded with a muffled yet distinct thud, and then another. And then its hinged lid was thrust open from within, and a man lurched unsteadily out, striding with the leading confidence of a drunkard. More than one hand in the Havelstoke room promptly clenched hard around the head of a stick, or balled into a fist. The man was clad in the black, many straps leathers that knights on horse at imperial weddings and funerals wore under their great gleaming coat of plate ceremonial armor. What could be seen of his body looked dead, his hair shedding head more sh mere shrunken skin over a skull that still had eyes. His hands and feet were bare, the fingers and toes sheathed in silver coated iron points. Gentlemen, Straker said proudly, Meet Steel Force, Mr. Bentley Steel Force, my prototype Iron Assassin. Outside this room, we call him the Silent Man. Steel Force nodded, slowly and deliberately, lifting his dead lips to bare his teeth in a grotesque smile. Then he started toward the table. His steps were stiff and slow, and as he came, he turned his head almost mechanically to stare at one seated man and then another. Small wonder that machine-like quality. Over his leathers was fitted a cage-like iron frame, an exoskeleton that glowed with tiny crawling lightnings and gave off sparks whenever its joints bent severely. Does, does it talk? Burton of Whitehall blurted out, horror warring openly with revulsion on his face. Good day. Mr. Burton, the walking dead man replied coldly. Then he shuddered, his eyes rolled up in his head, and he froze. Straker snapped his fingers. The silent man made that ghastly smile again, and his eyes slowly descended to regard the men staring at him. Excuse me, he said tonelessly. I was scenting. He looked at Straker. There are no blood slayers near. However, more than one of these men has touched a blood slayer recently. Straker nodded. And so, I follow, watch, and learn. Not attacking. Yet. Straker nodded again. Indeed, he said, his voice holding satisfaction. Is this man dead? 
Lord Staunton asked quietly. He is Lord, yet now lives again and is content to do so, Straker replied. In life, he was Bentley Roper, chimney sweep, killed when he fell off a roof in Hampstead. His wife and children are now provided for, and he is proud to serve the Empire of the Lion. I see no steam bells, no vents, Standish barked. No boiler or firebox, and unless you've been uncommonly clever, no room to hide him. So how does he move? As you've just seen, he moves himself. So is he a man? Standish growled. Or a machine? Steel Force's head turned in the policeman's direction, and Standish fancied he saw a momentary glow of blue-white current behind those dark, liquid eyes. He fought to repress a shudder. He remembers something of his living past, to be sure, Straker murmured. As to how much, he lifted his shoulders in a gentle shrug. More when he's warmed up and active, and the current's surging through him, to be sure. The current? Burton snapped. Like the, the flow of the Thames? Yes, Straker replied, and no. This current causes wires to glow and the steel force to move, to come to life for a time. If too strong, it kills. He waved at the crank on the floor. This is merely for demonstration purposes. A velocipede upended to make it stationary could be pedaled in harness with this generation generator I've cobbled together here beneath the crank to generate far more electricity and do so more quickly and steadily. Not every assassin would have to be accompanied by a man with a crank. Assassin, Lord Staunton echoed thoughtfully. Mr. Steelhorse destroys blood slayers. He does, six so far. Stryker pointed, observe his fingers and toes, capped in cold iron that is coated in silver. With these, he burns blood slayers when he grips them and unleashes some of his electricity of course through these points. Some of the silver, poison to a blood slayer, floods through the foul creature in an instant, immolating it from within. He also has forearm bracers fitted with many blades of cold iron and silver for intense fighting. A dead man made to walk, Burton muttered, lunacy. Your crowning lunacy thus far, Straker. Perhaps. Yet, have you a better weapon? The blood slayers grow bolder by the day. How many is it they've killed now, Standish? Six hundred some? Four thousand two hundred and four, the man from the yard growled. As of last official reckoning two mornings ago, the majority of another sixty-three possibles will probably in time be added to that. Straker regarded Burton well. Latest estimates are over 6,000, came the grim reply. The blood slayers are not confined to London, gentlemen. Good God, Hardcastle gasped, unable to stop himself. 6,000? And you've not told us? Burton's glare was stern. Sir, the figures have been withheld from the press to avoid a gentle, gentle panic. The last time London knew real fear, as you should recall. There were dozens of murders, countless accusations, shops burned, beatings in the streets, and that was a comparatively tame matter of the infectious crew of just one ship. There is such a thing as social responsibility, young man. Not that you'd be familiar with it, the dead man said flatly, astonishing them all into silence. Lord Staunton recovered first. How does your iron assassin work exactly, Mr. Straker? He said quickly, waving his sword cane in front of Burton warningly to quell an outburst. Straker clapped his hands together in delight at the proffered opportunity and started to pace like a master in the schoolroom. You see, gentlemen, the human brain works by electricity. Little pulses, brain waves, some call them, but in truth they are more like the short-lived little bolts of lightning than the waves that crash tirelessly upon our shores day and night, that carry our thoughts, bring back to what our eyes see and our ears hear to us, and send back commands from the wits in our skulls so we move a hand thus, or step so, rather than flailing about at random. Poppycock, Burton snorted, his eyes cold above the gleam of his spectacles. Piffle. The silent man slowly and deliberately turned his head to regard Straker, who gave a swift nod. Steelforce turned his head again, fixing his gaze on the man from Whitehall, who sneered back at him, thumbs now hooked into the pockets of his splendid waistcoat, and repeated petulantly, Piffle, I say. The dead man started to move. His strides were stiff and lumbering, each step pitching his shoulders from side to side like a man hurrying on stilts. But he went around two chairs as deftly as any dancer, picking up speed as he went. Around the table in a quickening rush, heading for Burton, 
whose sneer darkened into a defiant snarl as he hurriedly plunged his hands inside his waistcoat and drew out a gleaming pistol. Have a care, he said sharply. Come closer and I'll shoot. Not slowing in the slightest, the silent man shot out a hand to point accusingly at Holworthy Burton, and from one graying dead finger leapt a fat blue spark. It reached the barrel of the shaking gun and raced around it like quicksilver moonlight. Burton shouted in startled pain and dropped his weapon, his arm jerking wildly. His elbow slammed thunderously down on the table before the gun roared, hurling its death into the ceiling as it cartwheeled to the floor. Hallworthy Burton was not an easily frightened man. He'd fought more Christians in Tuscany and faced down the mad monks of Dun Abbey to say nothing of wrestling more than two score departmental pledges for the back offices of Whitehall. Yet he looked up, cursing and clutching at his elbow, right into a dead face that loomed above him and went the yellow-white of old bone, jaw quivering in fear. Poppycock, Steelforce said pleasantly, decaying nose almost touching his piffle. In the tense moment of silence that followed, he lifted his dead upper lip in that horrible smile again and turned away. <laughs>